This video is sponsored by Morning Brew. Listen, I'm gonna say something to you. Sometimes I act like an idiot, you know? I say things when I shouldn't. And, um... Shit, I've left Golden's foot on the coach. Sorry, mate. Severance is one of my absolute favourite comedy horrors, and I've wanted to cover this for a very long time. It tells the story of a European SEALs branch of a global weapons manufacturer known as Palisade, as they're invited, or rather coerced, into a team building weekend in a luxury lodge in a remote Hungarian forest. Okay, everybody, prepare to smile. However, after being forced to travel on foot due to a roadblock, they stumble upon a uh, lodge of sorts, and what ensues is many awkward, disgruntled mingling amongst employees as they slowly discover the barbaric dangers that stalk them from outside. I am genuinely excited to see what you all make of this one, but I do have to warn you now that while I will be addressing the danger in greater detail in a spoiler section later in the video, there's no getting past out of context visual spoilers because it is tricky to navigate a film that's truly best experienced by going in blind. The thing is, the danger of the story is in the synopsis and established in the beginning of the film, so it's not traditionally a spoiler, but it's the brooding presence, unusual build-up, and eventual revelation behind it that's worth experiencing for yourself. And even then, there's still an eerie obscurity that lingers over it. And I saw a geezer with a balaclava and a suitcase. No more of a travel bag. All I'm saying is, Severance does rely heavily on keeping you guessing for as long as possible, as it litters many subtle and not so subtle visual clues and foreshadowing that turns your expectations of an obvious hunter slasher narrative into something a tiny bit more, uh, thought provoking, let's say. Uh, sorry. Well, mostly. Now, let me just take a quick moment to thank this video sponsor, Morning Brew. I'm ashamed to admit that I used to mindlessly scroll through Twitter each morning as my unfortunate source for what's happening in the world, and let's face it, getting clear, convenient, and unbiased news on social media is like trying to find a needle in a loud, mouthy, apocalyptic haystack. However, thankfully, Morning Brew came along with their free, concise, daily newsletter that's sent to my inbox Monday to Sunday that simplifies traditional, boring news into a digestible, five-minute, witty, and informative read, especially for those interested in business, finance, or tech. For example, instead of digging through opinion after opinion, in the last week I've been able to get a clear picture on what's happening with the sickening discrimination lawsuit happening at Activision Blizzard, and on the lighter side, I learnt more about the current tobacco trade than I ever should have in my entire life, and yet it left me genuinely fascinated. Morning Brew is completely free and takes less than 15 seconds to subscribe, so if you're interested, click the link in the description box below to subscribe to Morning Brew today. Despite the generic sounding premise, Severance is a really fucking weird movie at times, as it starts out as an oddball comedy dealing with the frustrations of relatable workplace personalities, and eventually devolves into a harrowing survival horror reflective of the splatter genre resurgence at the time. While it received a small box office draw in the UK upon its release due to its main star Danny Dyer, Severance based most of its marketing on a vague over-reliance on comparing itself to Shaun of the Dead meets The Office. But to be honest, while that comparison is accurate, as a horror fan, I would argue it's a bit of an undersell to the plethora of other films that Severance could be compared to, going as far back as the fringes of 70s exploitation cinema. It's very much in the same vein as Neil Marshall's Dog Soldiers, where on the surface, you know what genre it loosely falls into as it wears its influences on its sleeve, but it doesn't let any of that dictate the storytelling. It flows organically between action, horror, and comedy without contradicting the clear, consistent tone it establishes from the very beginning. You found a pie? It was wrapped in foil. Oh, well, that's a relief. Jesus. Jesus. You dirty bastard. I have read comparisons to Deliverance, I mean the title is literally a play on it, but eh, I'd go as far as to throw in Hostile and Wrong Turn as equally valid contemporary comparisons, especially considering the latter film was also marketed with a similar level of backwoods horror ambiguity. In fact, if you really want a true stylistic portrait before jumping in, you're better just watching my videos on director Christopher Smith's other hugely underrated films, Triangle and Creep. 
It has moments of surreal and literal trippy imagery that's borderline fourth wall breaking, and when the action finally kicks in, the violence has this grimy grittiness that's typically missing in comedy horror. The first half of Severance is very much a character-driven satire, as everyone does their best not to kill each other, as egos clash while begrudgingly preparing for a mandatory work outing that nobody wants to participate in, except this guy. Uh, before we begin, the paintballing is about teamwork. Oh yeah, we all know someone like this, and anyone who has ever worked in an office setting will recognize these personalities. You have the spineless corporate ass-kissing manager Richard, smug salesman Harris who is an expert on everything, the polite and humble Billy who is just doing his job, morally driven Jill trying to change the establishment from the inside, cynical Maggie who plays the straight man for the audience, and as I've shown you, Gordon, the slightly inept upbeat puppy who surely won't have anything horrible happen to him. Stop! Stop it! That is really dangerous! Oh, trust me, if the marketing got one thing absolutely clear, it's that this guy gets fucked up, and you'll see where that hostile comparison comes into later. <sighs> Finally, there's Steve, played by Danny Dyer, who I'm probably going to have to explain to my international audience. If you look at my cock one more time, I'm gonna kick off. So, Danny Dyer was once a fairly prolific actor in early to mid-2000s UK cinema, and gained a reputation for playing hard lad English geezers who ranged from two-bit gangsters to cocky party boy narcissists. In fact, for a while it was a running joke that when you saw a Danny Dyer movie, you knew exactly what you were getting into, especially many of his later direct-to-video releases before he respectably moved into more mature soap opera television. He was notoriously disliked by many UK film critics for his supposed lowbrow performances, but he had a strong popularity amongst younger audiences because he reflected the very dominant lad culture at the time that normalised masculine traits and behaviours that some dismissed as simply boys will be boys. English birds ain't complicated, you buy them a Bacardi breezer and they'll ride you like sea biscuit. Dyer was basically what Sean William Scott was to Stifler style characters in the late 90s, early 2000s. This is why I think Dyer is perfectly cast in Severance. It gives his character Steve a chance to be vulnerable while playing against the perceptions critics had of Dyer himself. It's not that he gives a different or better performance, it's that his character is written in such a way to take advantage of his typecasting, and it works especially well given Dyer drops the ego to willingly make fun of himself. Have I pissed my pants? I'm just saying I don't think so. What's wrong with you? I feel all damp. Steve is ultimately just a harmless jackass who eventually acknowledges his own shitty behaviour, yet what truly reinforces it is that he does not emerge as this redemptive, strong, leading man hero in the end. He kinda withers into a secondary character, as Maggie is the real strong, resilient hero to take charge of the situation. It's not trying to aggressively lampoon lad culture, it's more of an empathetic portrayal to humanise it. We need to keep it cold. There's a fridge on the couch. That's great, thank you. Oh, you're shitting me. The best way to describe Severance is imagine taking the lighthearted, quirky characters from your favourite workplace sitcom like The Office or Parks and Rec or Brooklyn Nine-Nine and throwing them into a brooding horror movie where they get horrifically butchered and beaten one by one. That is literally what Severance aims to be. It's a comedy horror that starts as a comedy and becomes a horror. I've said it before, but I find many comedy horrors suffer from balancing one genre at the expense of the other, and usually it's the horror that suffers the most. But the film's co-writer James Moran stated that he and Christopher Smith had one rule when writing, no horror in the comedy and no comedy in the horror. As such, they strike a consistent balance while leaning more heavily on the horror and keeping the humour natural to the personalities and the situations the characters face. The first half has brilliantly timed jokes and countless witty interactions, but by the end you are not fucking laughing because it turns incredibly vicious. Keep your voice down. 
Admittedly, this video will not do the humor justice because the timing of a punchline usually surpasses how long I can actually play an unedited clip before I enter into YouTube's dodgy copyright claim territory. In fact, many jokes are layered one after the other and some are callbacks to information established earlier in the film or delivered without calling attention to the punchline itself, like in this scene where happy-go-unlucky Gordon dicks about on a diving board and later on you see him walking through the house soaking wet. It really is the type of film where you have to keep your eye on the small details because on top of that, the film loves to hide things in the background and use Chekhov's gun to set up innocuous details that have a payoff later on. Now, from here on out, I'm going to delve into the danger of the second half, so consider this your major narrative spoiler warning before we go any further. So, on the first night, three characters share stories about the origins of the Lodge and its connection to their company Palisade. As a weapons dealer and manufacturer, of course this was inevitably going to become a plot point, as the film loosely tackles the idea that the danger is essentially one of their own making. When you say sick fuckers, what do you mean? Here. Terrorists? Call them what you want. Although, thematically speaking, it deliberately avoids commenting too much on the morality of profiting off war and destruction because, after all, we are seeing the story through the eyes of characters so withdrawn and apathetic to what they do as to them, it's just a job. That's where the office comparison truly comes in. They are the weapon seals equivalent to Wernham Hogg or Dunder Mifflin. They don't give a shit about what they're selling. They grind their boring 9 to 5 office work and go home without a a guilty conscience like the rest of us. The only character to question ethics is Jill, but everyone just dismisses her as the uptight entitled grump who perpetually moans about everything, so it's difficult to take her seriously when, in between the discussions about designing human weaponry, she undermines her own morals by complaining about not staying in a Hilton hotel. Anyway, getting back on point, each story is presented from a unique stylistic point of view. The first is framed as a Nosferatu to inspire German expression silent film, as Harris believes the Lodge to be an old mental asylum from before the First World War. In his story, an inspector is sent in to investigate why the asylum has ceased communication and discovers that the patients have escaped and imprisoned the staff, prompting Palisade to unleash a nerve gas killing everyone except one patient who vows revenge on any Palisade employee. Is that supposed to be scary? Well, it was at the time. In contrast to this, the second story by Jill is presented with stark and harrowing raw footage that you would expect to find leaked on a dodgy website. She tells of a time in the early 90s post-Soviet Union where the area was used as a detention centre for savage war criminals who massacred entire villages and brutalised innocent civilians. These criminals were subjected to a field torturous recovery program, and Palisade's involvement was in supplying the weapons to the governments that eventually killed these men, except again, some are said to have escaped. But in Jill's eyes, revenge isn't what they seek, it's purely survival and being left alone in a remote forest that caters further to their savagery. The final story, however, uh... <laughs> Uh, kinda softens the blow a bit when Steve decides to tell a thirsty teal, to put it lightly. It was a sex lodge. <laughs> Have you ever taken anything seriously in your life? Ecstasy and weed, I think. Yeah, believe it or not, there is some relevance to this that I'll come to very shortly. Now, where things get interesting is that while Jill's story is proven to be the accurate explanation seeing as everything in her story does play out, she also admits that there is some truth to Harris's story, allowing you to add interpretation to explain many of the things that are left unanswered. For example, when Steve takes mushrooms, we see the obvious effects of it, but then later on, the same bizarre hallucinations happen to Richard, which made me think that the characters were possibly suffering the residual effects of the nerve gas Harris mentioned in his story. And when it comes to Steve's, uh, thirst, there is kind of a twist where he and Maggie eventually discover the actual luxury lodge they were supposed to go to, and you could almost make the argument it's the exact same one from Steve's story set in the 60s. 
The thing is, this unorthodox barrage of different styles in the first half plays right into this feeling that nothing is what it seems. It's only after Harris and Jill encounter the mutilated corpse of their coach driver and Gordon loses his leg to a bear trap that the deaths come very swiftly. Although what grabbed my attention during the rewatch was that I did start to suspect that each kill is theoretically reflective of the personalities and ironies of the various characters. Okay, so let me explain. Harris is the first to be killed, but his death comes with this appropriate level of smug satisfaction after claiming earlier to Jill that the brain continues to function briefly after decapitation. Thus fittingly, he dies knowing that he was right. Jill and Gordon get the most vicious deaths to play grotesquely into how they symbolize the extreme morality of the group, thus they receive the most undeserving, uh, sinful punishment you could say. Billy is shot and dies fairly abruptly, fitting his quiet, humble presence as the one single character to not cause a fuss, even in death, and Richard, I guess, receives the most poetically pathetic death. He steps on a landmine after abandoning the others, but later tries to make up for it by getting the attention of the killers so Steve and Maggie can escape, yet the killers end up just mocking him as he hesitates to blow himself up given the indecisive person that he is. I mean, good on him for eventually sacrificing himself, but it's not presented as a noble choice, he just doesn't have a choice. Oh, and I'm sure you've worked this out by now, but I should have mentioned this earlier. At first, you're led to believe there's only one killer as he gets shot by Maggie without any hesitation, but nope, there are seven of these fuckers. We got a problem. Yeah, no shit. No, we got another problem. That was our last bullet. I honestly think having multiple killers is far more terrifying than it has any right to be. I've just never seen a slasher movie like this and it reminded me greatly of how John Carpenter approached the murderous gang in Assault on Precinct 13. I would love to cover Precinct 13 at some point so I won't say too much but the gist of it is that Carpenter was actually inspired by Night of the Living Dead instead of traditional action movies and decided to dehumanize the gang as much as possible into zombie-like killers that give give them a borderline supernatural presence. Severance is pretty much the same. They don't speak, they don't rationalize, reason, or communicate, they just kill. They are bloodthirsty savages who will stop at nothing to joyfully tear apart those in their way. There's also the implication they're cannibalistic given the pie Gordon finds containing a tooth. In this absurdly strange way, Severance follows the basic premise of Goldilocks and the Three Bears. Hey look, you've made it this far, you might as well stick around. So what we have are these innocent Palisade employees essentially intruding the home of these violent men, eating their food and sleeping in their beds before being chased out, and it all mirrors how Jill frames Palisade as these wrongdoing outsiders barging into the lives of people who just want to survive. You see, Jill sees Palisade as guilty of fueling chaos and destruction while comfortably sitting in their ivory towers and wiping their hands clean of death and misery, and here we have a bunch of people who who are, as I said, apathetic of that guilt. Now, it's not trying to say that the killers are misunderstood, no, it's pretty clear they're fucking monsters, but it does add a thoughtful spin to the traditional slasher. Eventually, things come to a clean enough conclusion where Maggie and Steve fight back and along with the two Hungarian sex workers Steve hired in the opening of the film, oh for fuck's sake Steve, they finish off the savages and escape. Awesome. And that is Severance. I'm sure there are a lot of questions and WTFs to what I just described, but I really can't stress enough how important it is to go in blind and experience for yourself just how bonkers the film becomes. As I said, it is a surprisingly layered film and there are many details that just can't be explained without putting them in the context of other things that happen. Sure, it's not as tightly constructed or refined as Simon Pegg and Edgar Wright's Cornetto trilogy, but it really works as this brilliant bastard child in between. Severance is the Halloween special of a workplace comedy only to discover that the characters are facing real killers and the safe boundaries of sitcom logic collapses all around them. So in the comments below, give me an example of your favourite comedy horror that truly does work as a horror, one where scares and shocks really are the focus while still being capable of making you laugh along the way. And until next time, stay safe, stay away from your obnoxious colleagues, and I'll see you all very soon.